Okay, let's talk about some common fasteners that you will encounter. In your textbook, I know in the Hibbler text, it's normally table 5.1, in your textbooks you will have a table that will show you lots of common fasteners. At least you should. If not, you, you need to get a better book, in my opinion. Um, one of the most common ones that we'll encounter throughout the semester is called the pin. Right, the pin. And the pin would be something where, let's say I've got some something attached up here and it's attached right here at a pin and what do i mean by that well i've got a 3d print of one here something like that so you can see there's there's kind of a essentially a, some sort of a shaft or maybe some maybe we put some kind of pin through this since this is 3d printed we're able to print this as one piece but you can see it's something that can rotate around that point right now i can't move it if i pull on it i can't move it up you know, if I try to push it up in the y direction, it won't move. If I try to push it left or right in the x direction, it won't move. But it will rotate. So that's what motion is allowed. So common fasteners that you can encounter would be a pin. So if I were to draw this on a free body diagram, I would draw it one of two ways. Now, the most common way I would draw it, I would remove the pin structure, and I would just draw this, what, what, the, what that basically this is the anchor point right this guy really what i'm worried about is this and whatever is attached out here that's this is probably my structure out here i'm not so worried about what's going on at the ground here so i would remove this part to draw my free body diagram and at the pin at the connection what i would do is i would replace it with an unknown reaction in the x direction and an unknown reaction at the y direction right so a pin is going to have two unknowns a pin is going to have two unknowns normally i'm going to draw it as rx and ry so unknown x component unknown y component you can and this might be a bit confusing at first until you kind of work through this a bit you can if you would prefer draw it as an unknown magnitude resultant at an unknown angle theta and in this case you have two unknowns you either have an unknown amount of force and direction of that force or you have an unknown x and y component of that force and you can use trig to convert back and forth between the two so if i know these i can find those and if i know these i can find those in either case it's two unknowns right don't Don't do it this way where you say, oh, well, that means I've got, I've got um, Rx at, you know, cosine theta and Ry at sine theta. No, don't do that. Not this, because now I've got three unknowns. I've got Rx is unknown, cosine th the theta is unknown, and Ry is unknown. That's three unknowns. I don't have three unknowns. I only have two. I have the amount of force in the x direction and the amount of force in the y direction, or I have a total amount of unknown force at an unknown direction. In either case, those are two unknowns. This is three unknowns. This is not true. This is not what we have here. All right, so don't do that. That's, a, that's just a common mistake I see a lot of students make. I just want to try to hopefully catch you from doing that. Um, so that's one type of common fastener, that, that being the pin, right? Now, um, <clears throat> another common fastener is, is kind of takes a couple of forms, and that is the, it sounds kind of funny when I say it, the rocker or the roller. The rocker or the roller. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically if I've got, say, a ground, and I just have something making contact at a smooth point. That's a rocker. Or I could have something where it's setting on a ball or a roller. So sometimes it'll look like this. Another way it might look like a wheel, right? So this is how kind of a 3D print representation we have of one. So where is, we saw the hinge earlier, 
This is a roller type assembly. So basically it can move along the surface. It would be the same thing here. If I have something that is allowed to move basically parallel to the surface, it's allowed to move, but it can't move into the surface. Same thing here. I've got like a rocker basically. This is actually one that I think this is a pin or a roller that the, the implement in there is broken off, but you gotta get the idea, right? It, I can move it along the surface, but I can't move it into the surface, right? So what does that mean? Well, what that means <clears throat> is that in both of these cases, if I were to draw this on a free body diagram, I would have one unknown. That is the magnitude of the force. The magnitude of the force. In this case, as I've drawn it here, both of these, the ground is parallel. So the force is a normal force. It's always perpendicular to whatever surface causes it. Because again, I can move parallel to the surface, but I can't move it into the surface. Now, there's nothing preventing it from coming off. Kind of like a, a rope or a cable, it can only hold tension. Um, same thing here, there's, there's, um, it can only push back. If something causes this structure to come off at that point, there's nothing to hold it down. It can only push back. And the direction, the direction of this force is known. The direction is always perpendicular to whatever surface is implying it, right? So if I've got, um, I'm almost out of paper down here, but I can squeeze something down here at the very bottom. I got just a little more room, right? If I've got some unknown angle theta or some known angle theta, and I've got some sort of a rocker there, right? So if theta is um, measured from horizontal, when I draw the normal force to that, If this is measured theta from horizontal, the normal force, this unknown F, is gonna be theta from vertical because it's perpendicular, perpendicular to the surface here. So perpendicular to that surface is gonna be theta from vertical. <clears throat> All right. So again, these I've drawn horizontal surfaces, therefore the normal force is gonna be vertical. But in this case, um, and you'll find this a lot, you might have some sort of an inclined surface where that force then ends up being at an angle. All right, I've got a simple example here. Let's look at, um, let's put some numbers to one of these. L8, page five of something. Okay. So let's say that I've got just a beam here. Um, I'm gonna draw a pin on the left. We'll draw a beam coming out, attach that pin and it comes out and it's over here on some sort of a roller, a wheel or just a ball or some, something basically that applies a normal force. And this is a horizontal surface. And let's say that I've got, uh, again, example here, simple example. Let's say that I've got a force applied here at some 45 degrees. And let's say that force is 30 newtons. So 45 degrees from horizontal. And then a little further out, I've got a force of 50 newtons applied out here. And we'll say that the distances, now again, this is these, we're no longer dealing with particles, so the distances become very important. I've got two meters out here. I've got three meters between those two forces and I've got one more meter over here. Now normally we go ahead and start labeling these as letters. I like to use letters. A lot of times in the Hibbler book they use letters. So we'll say point A is on the left, point B is over here on the right. Okay, so what do we wanna do here? We want to find, the problem might say something like find the reactions required for equilibrium. Right. 
And so we want to find the reactions required to keep this thing in equilibrium. Basically, we're saying, what forces is this guy applying and what forces is this pin applying in order to keep this thing from moving? Well, <clears throat> looking for forces, a lot of times uh, we're, we're probably going to be using either Newton's first or second law. So it, this is an equilibrium problem. So we're going to use Newton's first law. What does that mean? It means I probably need a free body diagram to help me figure out what forces are here. The other neat thing here is when you draw a free body diagram, now I'm not drawing this initial diagram. I'm going to draw a simplified version of it. You could just draw a line here if you like. I'll go ahead and draw a bit of a beam. And wherever you've got some sort of a fastener, replace it with the appropriate reaction. So you go look in your table, in your book, uh, again in table 5.1 in the Hibbler text. Uh, you can refer back to your notes here, right? We said earlier that I've got a pin at this end, so the pin applies an unknown X and an unknown Y component. So here at this pin, I've got AY and AX that's at this far left-hand end of this beam. And then we said that if I've got a roller or a rocker, it's going to apply a force perpendicular to whatever surface is imparting that. That's, again, this is a horizontal surface, so it's going to be normal to that. It's going to be a vertical force B. So the magnitude of the force is unknown, but the direction is known. The direction is perpendicular to whatever's applying it then. And then, then I like to apply these forces resolved here, so I'm going to apply here a 30 newtons cosine 45 degrees, and then I've got 30 newtons sine 45 degrees, and then a little further over here I've got 50 newtons drawing these uh, in uh, to scale is a good idea, but it's okay. I've got two meters here, so I've not completely drawn this to scale, but it's not bad. Three meters out to that 50 Newton force, one meter all the way out to B. Okay. Now, we talked very early on about general problem solving. Right? What are we trying? What are we looking for? We're looking for the reactions. I'm looking for A X A Y and B. So what what's known about it? I've organized what's known about this information now. Now I need to say, okay, what what equations or tools or laws can I use to try to find a solution? Well, I can use Newton's first law. Newton's first law says apply equilibrium that sum of forces in all directions are equal to zero. All right. And so here I've got uh, sum of forces in the x direction. I'm going to have AX plus 30 newtons times the cosine of 45 degrees. And those appear to be the only two forces I've got in the x direction. So one, one equation, one unknown so far. But I still have two more unknowns I'm trying to find. So sum of forces in the y direction. Add those up, they should add up to be zero. Uh, what have I got in the y direction? I've got AY. I've got also in the positive y direction, I've got B. In the negative y direction, so minus, I've got 30 newtons times the sine of 45 degrees. And then also negative, I've got minus 50 newtons. So that gives me two equations, three unknowns. It means I need one more equation. Now, in chapter three, we would have said, well, okay, maybe I need to draw another free body diagram. Maybe, maybe I can't solve this. But remember, we've introduced another concept now. We have moments now. So now I can take the sum of moments. And normally, we've just been taking the moment about the end over here on the left. You don't have to. You could take the sum of moments about any point. I could take the sum of moments about point B here. And that would be just fine. Nothing wrong if you want to say find the sum of moments about point A. Um, in fact, we can do that. Let's just say sum of moments about point A. Right? So about point A, um, so notice that AX and AY both pass through point A. And if this beam is not real thick, now had they given me the thickness of this beam, um, I might could say, well, 
I've got just you know half the thickness of this beam, this X component's causing a tiny little moment. But I think we're just gonna assume that the beam is essentially negligible width. Had they given me a width of the beam, I might use that to find this X component's moment. But since they didn't, what I've got here is this Y component. Um, it's gonna cause a moment, right? Notice that that's gonna cause a clockwise moment. And this Y component's gonna cause a clockwise moment. But this B out here is gonna cause a counterclockwise or a positive moment. So I'm gonna start with him. You could start with any of them. I like to start with the positive one, so it's one fewer character I have to write. This unknown B out here, all the way out at six meters, is causing a positive moment. And then causing negative moments, I've got minus 30 newtons, sine 45, 45 degrees, and it's out there at two meters. And I'm gonna write on the second line here, I should have just wrote my moment equation down here where I had more room. That's silly of me. Anyway, uh, also on the second line, then minus 50 newtons, and that's out here at a distance of five meters. Okay, so notice here, if you take your moments at a point where you've got your some unknowns, those unknowns don't, don't cause a moment about that point. I could do the same thing here and take the moment about point B, and then AY would cause a moment about point B, but AX would not, and B would not. So I could take some of the moments about B and, and write the exact same type of equation here. Um, I would encourage you to pause the video here and see if you can write a sum of moments about B. Uh, and, and get to the same conclusion when you solve that that I'm about to solve now. So with that said, if you wanted to pause here uh, and get values, now you got three equations, three unknowns, so feel free to pause and get numbers. All right, you got them? All right, I have written here that B is equal to 48.74 newtons. I've got AY equal to 22.5 newtons. And AX actually ends up picking up a negative sign. It is minus 21.2 newtons. And that brings up a nice bit of a discussion. Notice I've drawn AX going to the left. I'm sorry, going to the right, going in the positive x direction. But notice that this force up here, this guy is also pushing to the right. So what would happen if I've got this hinge here at this point and I pull on it, notice this hinge is going to have to pull back to counteract this force, the X component of this force here. So if I pull on it, that pin's pulling back in order to keep this thing, this whole thing from moving. This actually has to be applied in the negative X direction. And that's the reason we got a negative sign. So you, you could have looked at this and said, hey, Steve, I'm, I'm just gonna not even mess with it. I'm just gonna say, well, this isn't obviously because this is positive X. This obviously has to be negative X to counteract it. And so you could have just drawn a negative X and then just put a negative sign on it in your equation. And that would have been just fine. Nothing wrong with that. I just out of habit, cause I'm really bad at details. So out of habit, I try to put everything uh, systematically positive if I know it can stand up and just uh, pick up a negative sign later. Uh, a lot of times that's what I'll do. All right, that's a nice stopping place. I'm a little longer than I like to go, but uh, that's okay. We'll pick up the next one.